All right. Um, I know it's been a long day, so I'll try and keep this brisk. Uh, my name is Rishal. I work at Intellect. Also founded a company called Prolific Idea last year, um, where we basically try different ideas that, that I have um, and see if they're feasible or not. So you might have seen Hivemind outside. That's one of the apps that we've built, that we've launched recently. So check it out. Tell me if it sucks or, or if you like it. I'm open to feedback. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about virtual reality and JavaScript. So why VR? Because I like sci-fi and I like trying to do game development and all of those cool things. Um, and JavaScript because it makes it easier to do it in JavaScript because you want to be hipster. And you think everything's easy in JavaScript because we use it. So I just want to talk a bit about that. So first off, what's VR all about? Um, essentially, VR is immersive experiences. At least that's what I take away from it. So there's a lot of definitions out there that want to differentiate between augmented reality and virtual reality and all these different concepts. But I think what we're trying to aim for eventually is ubiquitous computing, which is, which is what I'm going to get into a bit later. Um, so VR lets us go to different and unreal places. So this may be a sci-fi world that doesn't exist, um, World of Warcraft or some other kind of world. It may be a world that improves your, your way of learning. You might be more susceptible to learning in that world. Or it may be simulating environments, simulating this beautiful area that you can experience without actually being there. VR also lets you experience different activities, and you might have seen the sort of most popular one, which is the roller coaster, or driving, driving a sports car, or training. Um, so VR lets you experience these activities. Maybe not to the point where it feels completely real yet, but I think it'll get there. And VR can also be used for experiencing events like concerts or Street View, Google Street View with Google Maps, um, you can feel like you're at a place and actually figure out how to navigate that place or figure out um, what this museum looks like that you'll never get a chance to go to or you want to go somewhere and you want to first check it out. Um, I think this also, uh, another point of this is not just for enjoyment but also it opens up these opportunities to people that are disabled, that can't really go to these places. It's not accessible to them. They're not able to climb a mountain and be on top of a waterfall. And they can sort of experience that through virtual reality. And this is all due to our human input. So this is how we experience things, how we react to things, and we make decisions. So I'm going to go through some of the inputs, but there's also the fact of human consciousness, which could be another talk for a philosophy conference. But um, some people believe that, that you know, that's part of, a, part of us, that, uh, what makes us human. We're not just machines. But let's assume we are machines, and these are our inputs. Our first input is sight, so we're able to see. Um, this is most consistent. Most things people see are consistent. If you see a soccer ball, the next person will probably also see a soccer ball. If you interpret a movie in a specific way, um, if we all watch a movie today, most of us would probably interpret it and interpret that message the same way. Um, if we look at colors, we see most colors the same way. The other one is hearing, audio. This is also most understood as a, as a language. People experience music in a similar way, no matter what culture you're from or what region you're from. Um, touch. So we try to simulate this in virtual reality with haptic feedback, but touch is something we all experience very differently. Some people um, might not like their personal space invaded by someone else. They might not like interacting with certain things. They might be a bit fussy, if you could say that. So I think touch is something that's, that we're all a little bit more different in. And I'd say also taste. So that term, everyone has a different taste. This is true. So you might like hot food. I don't like hot food. You might like sweet food. I might not like sweet food. So this is also one of the inputs that varies a lot. And then smell. 
<laughs> and this usually dictates whether we feel pleasant or unpleasant in a specific experience. Deadpool likes that smell clearly. So these are just the different inputs that we have that let us experience things that we, we um, interpret in the world. Now, let's look at some emerging technologies in the space of VR and what you can do with them. So one of them is this unit over here. I don't know if you've seen it before, but basically immerses you into a first-person shooter game. Um, not just with your, your visual and audio, but also physically. You have to run, you have to hold a gun, you have to aim. Um, this is great. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the movie Gamer. Um, it's a sci-fi movie where a little kid plays the role of a prisoner who actually has to go and shoot people and play a game like Counter-Strike or Battlefield. Um, so that's what this unit lets you do. And the use is not just for gaming, but for training. Uh, just here in South Africa, there's virtual reality software to help people on mines learn the equipment before they actually get put on mines. So it's got more uses than just entertainment. Gaming is a big inf influence on this, though. Now, these concepts are huge in gaming because people are more susceptible to see them as positive experiences because games are enjoyable. So there is a, a, a rumor or a myth that Microsoft included Solitaire and My, uh, Minesweeper in, in Windows to teach people how to use the point-and-click device, the mouse, um, because it's a game, it's enjoyable, and it's training you subconsciously on how to use that, that input device. And I think for this kind of technology that's going to push us forward, gaming is a great start because they're doing exactly what, what that myth um, that Microsoft did. Also simulations. So this is simulating experiences or simulating training where lives depend on it. If you screw that up, you're going to kill somebody. Someone's going to die. So I think it's also very important for us to progress as humans. Um, from a sort of ethical perspective as well. And then you also get augmented environments, and this is changing how people see reality. It's, I see it as adding an additional sense. So we saw those different inputs that we have. I see augmented reality as another addition to that. It's allowing you to see something but that's not there, but also interact with it. And I think the way your brain is eventually going to process that, if that's every, all everywhere around you, it's going, to th it's going to think differently, it's going to work differently. Um, and that gets me to, to the point on <coughs> augmented reality. How cool would it be if you're running a race and you could see this kind of information about the people around you? Um, that would probably influence how you race or how you run. Or if it's your friend that's Carlos over there, you're going to be like, man, I should help him um, before he falls over. But you know, this guy, Michael, I need, a, I need to get ahead of him. So it opens up a lot of, of cool, um, cool things we can do with it. And you, you must have seen this with Pokemon Go that just got released a couple of weeks ago. I know to some it's quite an annoying topic. I'm annoyed by it because everyone's on their phones all the time. But it's been so successful um, in just a short period of time. And that just shows the, the power that this technology has in, in what we do. Um, I'm not saying it's just the technology, I actually think it's the, the Pokemon concept um, with the technology that made it successful, but it's just an example of how this can be used widely. And this all brings us to, to that term I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, ubiquitous computing. So this term was coined quite a while ago, and it basically explains that at some point in our technological advancements, we'll be surrounded by computers, but we wouldn't be interacting with these things as if they're computers. We'd be interacting with them as if it's a natural part of our environment. If you look at cell phones, back in the day when they first came out, you knew you were interacting with the cell phone or a computer. When they became smartphones, it's a computer that I'm interacting with. And now it's almost become an extension of ourselves. If you forget your phone at home, you actually feel lost you feel disconnected. Um, and I think it's with ubiquitous computing, it's basically making the whole environment around us um, interactable as a computer. <clears throat> and
And this opens up new areas for innovation and problem solving. So we go to the conferences like this or UX conferences and we, and we think we've solved things and we try to learn from people, but I think human-computer interaction is going to change completely with this kind of technology. All the things we know is going to be thrown out the window because there's different ways of interacting with things and there's different ways that people interpret things. Another big one is the Internet of Things. So all these little devices that are trying to automate your life, automate your home, sensors that are trying to be smart around the world to help us in whatever we're doing. I think that's a very, very important part of augmented reality and that journey towards ubiquitous computing. Imagine if you didn't, have to need, you didn't need access cards for certain things, you didn't need to sign a register when you walked into the conference, things just happened. It knew that you meant to be here. The gate opened for you. Um, you know, things just happen, and that's a big part of, of ubiquitous computing where everything is connected and learning and understands what each individual needs and what makes the most productive. The other area, hardware performance. So to get truly immersive virtual worlds, if you're doing 3D worlds, you need pretty good hardware on that. So apart from the graphic side of it, energy. So how do we store and conserve um, energy on our phones and on our devices to, to cater for this? Because I haven't played Pokemon Go, but if you hear everything about it, it really kills your battery. It doesn't last very long. Um, so how is that sustainable? So I think these types of technologies pushes other areas like energy. Um, another one could be connectivity. So the need for better mobile networks, better internet connections. Um, and I think although we want to do that for entertainment or for these cool technologies, I think we need that because there's a lot of areas in the world that doesn't have this technology and introducing more advanced technology will give them access to at least some of the low-end technology. And then the last area I want to mention, which is by no means the last area that may be impacted by this, is data mining and machine learning. Now, if you think about a ubiquitous environment or ubiquitous um, computing world, there's so much data, there's so much interactions, there's so much activities happening by so many people on so many different computers. Now, we need to learn from that data and we need to be able to make things better. Um, we're already doing that with, with machine learning on our web applications and Facebook and Google are doing that with all the data they've stolen from us. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to use these techniques to improve the environment. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing that they, what they're doing with it. They know where I live and they know where I work and they can tell me how long it's going to take or don't leave now. So that's really cool. And we'll need to do similar things with, with the, this kind of technology in our world. Now, in terms of, of the VR scene, I'm going to go through some hardware that you probably know already. One is the Oculus Rift, which is one of the most successful um, VR hardware headsets. Next one is a Google Cardboard, which you all should have now, thanks to Intellect. Um, other hardware is Wands. So how do we interact with these virtual worlds? And this is by uh, Sony. So this is the ones that let you actually do things in this world that, um, that you're immersed in. And this one I found quite interesting. This one doesn't use skeletal tracking or, or anything. They took a different approach, and they work with your muscles and a gyroscope to, to sense movement. So based on your muscles contracting or expanding, it knows exactly what you're doing with your, with your hand. Um, if you're clenching your hand, how... how how hard are you clenching it? Which fingers are moving? Which is very interesting as well. So in this um, promo image that I found, this guy is actually able to fly a drone with his hand. And then the last one is skele skeletal tracking. So these are things like the Kinect, um, the leap motion. And this basically detects your bone structures and tries to work with that. So enough about sort of the, the concepts, how do we develop for this with JavaScript? So I think the first one to go through is the 3D worlds with JavaScript and, and what you can do with that. And since you all have some, the Google Cardboards, I think you can actually go home and try some of this. So I actually want to show you a, I want to show you a VR experiments page. 
by Google. So this is basically um, what you would see in, a, in, a, in your VR world. There's two screens for, for both the lenses, but um, you can do some cool stuff like this. <clears throat> I'm going to leave that. The point of it is I'd like you guys to go and uh, visit this. It's the Chrome VR experiments and just see how easy it is to, to get something up and running. So when you're developing for, for your 3D virtual worlds with JavaScript, your best friend is 3JS. I did a talk on 3JS, I think, like two years ago at this conference. And they've made it so easy to work with WebGL and JavaScript. So have a look at 3JS. A lot, you're going to be doing, basically what you're going to be doing is controlling the camera and point of view um, from the person's perspective through the goggles. Um, that's the biggest change when, when developing for VR. And keep in mind that the camera is controlled by the accelerometer and gy gyroscope of your device. So that's why you put your phone in and some of the, the high-end devices actually have the sensors built in. So this creates the illusion of being immersed. And this guy made this really cool boilerplate uh, template on GitHub. And that basically gets you up and running with 3JS as well as a camera that's point of view in the VR um, with the Google Cardboard uh, VR headset, which is, which is quite nice to get started. Okay, so let's get to interactions now. So we want to be able to interact with this stuff. Um, how would we interact with it? So the most natural way to interact into a world that you're immersed in is not with the mouse and keyboard. Ideally, you don't want any hardware controls. You don't want those ones that you have to carry around. You want to be able to just do it naturally. And that's why I think that Mayo device that works with your muscles is really cool. Uh, but the one that I want to talk about is the Leap Motion. So I've been playing around with this little device. It's basically for your hands. It uh, does motion and skeletal tracking on your hands. Um, so think about it. What, is, what does it look at? So you have arms that you use. You have hands. And on your hands, you have fingers. Um, but what's behind all of that? It's your bones. So that's why the skele skeletal tracking is the important part. The thing is you still need a device that's not on you. Um, that you have to be aware of when you're interacting with it. But I think it's a good start. I think in the future we'll progress and get cooler technology, but let's look at this for now. So the Leap Motion API for JavaScript is quite simple. You have, everything's focused around a hand. So a hand ha has an arm. Um, this gives you an arm position. So it's an X, Y, Z um, coordinates of the arm's position. It also estimates the elbow position, because you can't see the elbow, but they've made an algorithm based on human form, as well as the positioning of your, of your hand and your wrist. It can estimate where your elbows are. Um, you can also check the palm position, so is the palms facing down or up or, or whatever. Pin strength is pretty cool because it lets you determine how hard someone's grabbing onto something or pinching onto something. Um, the confidence property tells you how accurate the reading actually is from the device. And the fingers, guess what it is? It's a list of fingers, so all the fingers on your hand. Um, there's some really cool functions like pitch, roll, and yaw. So if anyone's developed anything in the 3D space, you'd be familiar with this. But basically, here's a, a cool diagram that illustrates what that means. So your roll is basically how you'd move on, on the, what is this? This is the Z axis, um, if you're looking at the plane f uh, from the front. The yaw basically shows rotation on the X axis, and the pitch is rotation on the Y axis. So this is often used when you're actually developing 3D games or 3D environments. Um, but you don't need to know a lot of the maths behind it, because these cool wrappers that we use handle that for you. Now, when we get to fingers, it actually, those are the, those are the names of the different uh, properties in that hand. So you can easily tell what finger you're working with. And if you want to go even deeper, you can look at the bone property. So they go into full depth on, on the bones in your actual hand. So if you look at, look at this, we've got 
um, one, two, three, four different types of bones in most fingers except your thumb, which is a length, um, metacarpal zero length. Now, you might think it's going to be really difficult to do all of these math calculations on each individual bone and each individual finger and figure out what position it is and how it's moving. But this SDK actually has a lot of um, built-in plugins that you can use. So Leap created the Gestures plugin, which lets you detect things like swiping, key taps, screen taps, and circular gestures um, as a start. There's a range of other plugins created by Leap, uh, Leap Motion themselves, as well as the community on GitHub. And you can get a plugin for basically anything. So I want to show you quickly what, what you actually see if you have one of these. So basically, this is the diagnostics environment with the Leap controller. Um, and you can see it's pretty accurate in, in detecting what I'm doing with my hands. So you can do some pretty cool stuff with this. Um, this is just the di diagnostics, and you can see the camera actually changes <coughs> its position to actually uh, move with your hands to give you as much space to work with as possible. Now I want to show you some examples of how this is actually used in code. Okay, so if you look here, I just made a little demo. Um, those are the... <coughs> Two dependencies are included, so the one is the Leap Motion SDK and the other one is the plugin for the gesture controls. Um, now here's the interesting part. All you need is to call the Leap Loop function. Basically what that does is it tells the device to start listening for any activity with your hand. Um, once it's listening, it will give you a frame. So you can't really determine or you can't set how many frames it should, it should um, track per second, but you can actually find out how many frames it's tracking based on the device you have. So what Leap have done is they, they said that their device will always support the software that they release, which we'll see what, we'll see what happens, but um, uh, I think later devices have a higher frame rate than older devices. The next thing that's quite interesting is the hands. So right now I'm looking at the current frame I'm looking for the hands, and for each hand, I want to change something based on the roll. So I explained that the roll is this movement in, in the 3D space. I'll show you why I'm doing that in a bit. The next section here basically shows you how you can get gestures. So in the frame, look at the gestures, and for each gesture, we're just determining what it is in the switch statement. So this is an exhaustive list of the different uh, gestures. We've got circle gesture, uh, key tap, screen tap, swipe, and you can even determine if it's being swiped left, right, up or down with a little bit of math. So it's really easy to use the SDK. So the reason why I, I wanted to show you guys this code is because often when you think of things like 3D and WebGL and you know, virtual reality and these cool devices, you think it's sort of out of my league. I can't understand that. I'm not going to be able to work with it. But it's really that simple. So I'd like to show you how this actually works um, or what you can make with it. So I put together a little, a little demo last night. Oh, my battery's on 5%. So this is just uh, like some confetti. <clears throat> so what I wanted to do is try to move it with my hand. So if you see, see me wave these different ways, I can, I can move it. Um, if I want to make them bigger, I can, I can use that interaction to make them bigger. I can use a swipe to reset the scene. Um, I can do spirit fingers to make it all colorful. <laughs> so. So yeah, that's basically just a little demo of what you can do with, with this little device. It's literally that big. Um, I'd like to see you guys try some stuff with the, at least the, the Google Cardboards. We're giving away two of these, so maybe you can do something cool and integrate them and then tell us about it, share it. I'm always interested in seeing that, that kind of stuff. 
Um, and yeah, that's it from, from my side. I try to keep it short because I know it's been a long day. Um, are there any questions? Okay, let's start. I don't know, have you heard of um, A-Frame? Sorry? Have you heard of A-Frame? A-Frame? Yes. Because uh, it's like a, it's a, it's a VR, so they basically want to introduce kind of VR to the web. So basically they, they, they created this library where they have um, a few examples and when you put on your VR process, it actually puts you in um, okay. a new environment. So it's basically VR for the web, okay. using JavaScript. So I wanted to know um, how, like, what do you think is possible using that? Okay. With, um, I haven't used it, so I wouldn't be able to comment on that. <laughs> okay, cool. Please try it out. Yeah. Um, okay, so with the accelerometer like kind of device controlling the camera and bringing VR into the browser, can you use Chrome DevTools and the accelerometer kind of like simulator to simulate actually having a VR headset on you? Yeah, I haven't tried it, but I think that's the reason why they've included those tools. So in those VR experiments, I haven't tried it with the DevTools, but I've seen a VR experiment that lets you control a slider in the browser that actually adjusts it. So they might actually just be hooking into the dev tools. But um, it would be worth checking out. And also, can I just ask, when it comes to bringing in 3D worlds into this VR experience, is there a workflow or a tool that you recommend? I know a, a lot of the time they'll use 3D rendering software, but how does that fit in getting it into the browser? Okay, so what's cool about 3JS is it accepts most um, models from like Blender or Maya or 3D Max. So you'll design your 3D models in one of those tools and you can import them into 3JS. So you can go really complicated and try to um, create all the vertices of the object you're trying to create and put that into, into 3JS, but there's tons of open source 3D models out there that you can just make use of if, you, if you're not familiar with the 3D tools. Um, I was trying, when I first tried to learn this stuff, I wanted to make a, 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 like a spaceship thing, and I can't 3D model a spaceship, so I found tons online. Uh, but 3JS supports all of that, that's why I'd recommend it. I think, I think it's the sort of de facto standard now with working with uh, WebGL in your browser. Yeah, I noticed the same thing around that time, but I think they've progressed or they've put more attention on that, on that side of their, their development. I think at the time they were still not in version 1 of the API and they're now in version 3. So they've made quite a bit of improvements and I think they've realized that they need to focus on that if they're going to get developers to actually make prototypes and make games and examples and get, get this thing widely used. Um, it's not just for JavaScript, they've also got APIs for Unity. If you guys do a bit of game development, you'll know Unity. Um, and that's basically C Sharp. And there's also APIs for the Unreal Engine. Uh, with, with the JavaScript libraries we, we have now, can we combine things like uh, the leap motion and like a Cypress here headset to do yeah. like, interactions? Definitely. As long as, so, so why I was a bit skeptical about the Google Cardboard is because that's running off your phone and you'd have to plug the leap motion into the phone. But if it's running off your, your machine, you can definitely do something like that. So if you have a, a HTC um, VR headset that plugs into here, you've got your leap motion on there, you can definitely do something cool. I'd recommend uh, just Google or YouTubing, um, it's called Orion, Project Orion from Leap Motion. And they basically show, it's like magic, this guy's making cubes and things in this virtual world. And it's just using the <coughs> Oculus and the, the Leap Motion controller. The only difference is it doesn't sit on the bottom, it actually, uh, you plug it onto the, the VR headset itself. Uh, um, in terms of WebVR, do you know 
what the relation is between frame rates, because as far as I know, Chrome caps out their frame rate at 60 frames per second, and most of the sort of high-end VR headsets aim for a minimum of 90. Yeah. So, do you know what's happening in that space? Because you don't want, obviously you don't want motion sickness. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a browser restriction, um, just with browser technologies, because from the examples I've seen, and uh, the guys more prominent in the community, the cool stuff that they're developing, they're doing it in, not even in Unity, they're doing it with the Unreal Engine and writing that stuff in C++. Yeah. Um, and that's because of the power you have on an on a actual full GPU and control to the, the lower level instruction. So I think it's a browser constraint. Yes. So I don't, I don't really know if this is a relevant question mark, but with the leak motion, how is it detecting that it's actually a hack? So what is its range? If I really stand up and move the map, will it still be able to detect it's a hack? Or if, let's say, I put up my feet? Because they, they, they still don't have holes and they still have the same joints. Yeah. And then what about a mannequin's hat? So the wear are its limitations with regards to it being a human or it having to be a human? So I don't think it has to be a human. It doesn't know if it's you. It basically works off the skeletal structure of whatever it's seen. Sorry? Is it just a program? You asked about it. Edge detection. Yeah. I'm just wondering because I mean, you can combine it with something like a heartbeat monitor and actually determine if it's a human, which would be quite interesting. Yeah. That could be really cool. I think uh, Simon's telling me to stop now because we're out of time. If you guys want, I'll be here afterwards for a few minutes so you can ask me questions or just um, ask me on Twitter. Thanks. <laughs>